Hello everyone, I'm Abdullah al Rezwan, your host of InvestRec, which is a weekly podcast focusing especially on capital market. It is our absolute pleasure to let all of our listeners know that the guest of our today's episode is Mr. Shahid Al Islam, CEO and Portfolio Manager of VIPB Asset Management. His managed funds have consistently outperformed not only the broad market, but also other fund managers in Bangladesh. Just to give you the right perspective, BDT 100 invested on January 1, 2012 in the closed-in mutual funds managed by VIPB has grown to BDT 195.5 on December 31, 2016, whereas during the same period, it would only be BDT 95.8, meaning you could actually incur a loss if invested in a hypothetical broad market index. Therefore, even in a beer market, VIPP's performance has been nothing short of phenomenal. The closed-end mutual funds that are still trading in the Dhaka Stock Exchange are NLI First Mutual Fund and ACBL First Mutual Fund. VIPB has recently also launched an open-ended mutual fund named VIPB Accelerated Income Unit Fund. Mr. Islam has had a career in finance and investment spanning over 15 years. Before joining VIPB as a CEO in 2008, he worked in investment management in Asian Tiger Capital Partners. Prior to that, he worked as the head of non-bank institutions in Citibank NA. In 2000, he started his career as a treasury officer in American Express Bank and in 2002, he joined Credit Agricole in the Suez as the head of treasury operations. After working three years there, he joined IFC of World Bank Group in business development. He is a CFA charter holder and currently the president of CFA Society Bangladesh. He is also an MBA from IBA, University of Dhaka. Let's start our discussion with Mr. Shahid Al Islam. Shahid Bhai, welcome to our podcast Invest Track. It is an absolute honor to have you as our guest. Thank you so much for giving us your valuable time. Uh, thanks, Rajon. Thanks for having me. Uh, first of all, I would like to congratulate you uh, for your consistent outperformance over the market as well as other fund managers in Bangladesh. All of your funds have done persistently and exceedingly well since the very inception uh, of, of the launch of these funds. Hence, this leads to the obvious question uh, that, we ha- that, uh, that actually probably many of us have. Uh, what do you think is the source of such, in, co- such consistent outperformance? And what would you identify as some of the key reasons for this outperformance? Well, thanks. Uh, well, our funds have uh, definitely outperformed the market and we have done better than the other asset management companies in the last six years. In fact, uh, in 2011-15 period, the market was down by 10% on an average per year. Mm-hmm. And during that time frame, uh, we generated about 12%, more than 12% return per year. Phenomenal. So these are the numbers from IDLC. They do a fantastic report weekly on mm-hmm. mutual fund performances. So and uh, in 2016, uh, the market was um, up by about like... Um, Eight percent, eight point nine. Eight percent, and we made about like um, uh, about twenty percent. Wow! So every year, on an average, we outperform the market by about, on an average, I would say about twenty percent in the last few years. Uh, so yeah, th- that's extraordinary. Mm-hmm. And as 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 I said, we did better than any other asset management company in the country in last like, last six years. Well, you asked me the reason. Right. Well, the first of all, I think Bangladesh is like um, one of the most inefficient markets in the world. So market inefficient means like uh, security prices don't reflect their their intrinsic value. And that's an opportunity for, for value investors like us. We are a bit different. We are contrarian and we are value oriented investors. And I think we don't have too many uh, 
investors in our country in Bangladesh who follow that approach uh, we are different from others I think that's uh, I think that's the reason and well I say I tell you I mean I told you like Bangladesh is one of the uh, one of the most uh, inefficient market in the world well uh, but uh, I think I need to justify why why mm -hmm. I, I mean why I say that yeah well, in last 10 years, you might have noticed like closed and mutual funds have traded in the range of like um, from 60% discount to net asset value mm -hmm. to 600% premium to net asset value. <laughs> so that's quite a range. Quite a range. And that is like unbelievable. I don't think that ever happened anywhere in the world in the history of capital market, you know, and mutual funds should always trade at a price close to their net asset value. Right. Even like 10% deviations can create a lot of hue and cry. It's like, how come? Yeah. But here we are talking about like 60% discount and at some other point in time, 600% premium. So that indicates a lot of things. That indicates like, of course, the lack of confidence in mutual fund, lack of proper governance, but it also, I mean, indicates the fact that Bangladesh market is one of the most inefficient markets in the world. And that is, I think, a great opportunity uh, to uh, generate extra return, what we call alpha. Mm -hmm. And um, and so if I ask your question specifically, how we did it? Mm -hmm. Well, of course, we invested in companies well-governed companies, uh, good companies at good valuation. But we did few other things that other asset management companies didn't do. One thing would be like, we were perhaps the first asset management company in Bangladesh who invested in government bond back in like 2012-13, when the yield was very high, very high, prices were very low. Probably in the range of 12-13%. Yes, like 10-15 uh, years uh, maturity bonds were like, uh, I mean, giving 12-13% yield. Mm -hmm. Well, we didn't take uh, that high risk, like we didn't invest in 10-15 years maturity bonds, but we did invest in 5-year maturity bonds like at yield around like 95 10%. Mm -hmm. and then Still the, a pretty good yeah. return. Then the yield came down mm -hmm. and we made a very good profit from them. Mm. And we also did like we invested in mutual funds, closed and mutual funds that were uh, uh, that were due to uh, mature in in few years time, and that still they were trading like at very uh, significant discount. Mm -hmm. Well, market in general has had a lot of I mean had a massive lack of confidence in those mutual funds, but we thought like the mutual funds had to be uh, liquidated at mm -hmm. their maturity. I mean, or converted to open-ended funds. Or converted to open-ended mutual funds. So they cannot remain like at such deep discount to net, net asset value uh, for that long. So we took position in some of those funds and that happened uh, and the liquidation happened. And then we made pretty good return from them. It seems like a plain vanilla investment. Yeah. Why don't others just you know, understand this very uh, simple truth? Well, the fact is, you know, uh, even as of now, there are good mutual funds that are trading at 30% discount in net asset value. Two years, three, uh, well, the funds will be liquidated in like two, three years time. Mm -hmm. But still people are not investing because, you know, many people think two, three years is a very, very, very long, long time, time horizon. <laughs> you know, everybody is short term oriented. They want to have quick return, right. you know, and in the process, like they speculate, they lose money. But as I said, we are, we are we are a bit different, you know. We have longer horizon, and uh, we have patience, mm -hmm. and uh, and that, that's how we have. That has to be the winning formula in, in this industry. You have to be different. Yeah, it's, sure. If you just follow what everyone is doing, you are mm -hmm. supposed to be doomed in the long run. Sure. Uh, so how do you pick your stocks? Uh, do you have full-fledged valuation model in Excel files, or do you have your own method of discovering new investment opportunities no of course like uh, as we are value invested investor we ha we have to have valuation mm -hmm. model mm -hmm. and we do uh, use excel mm -hmm. and and also like what we do we read uh, 
uh, cell side equity research re reports from mm. black EPL, mm. city brokers, IDLC. I mean the the good ones. Yeah. Uh, and and we read them. We t we get. I mean the facts from them. And mm. and we have our own call. Right. Uh, and on top of that, basically, we have like some other criteria like who are the auditors of the company. Is it the market leader? What I mean on top of everything. I mean, do we like? Uh, believe in the numbers, the company report, and of course the corporate governance. It has to be uh, uh, well-governed companies. Uh, but unfortunately, we don't have too many companies in Bangladesh um, that are well-governed. And so, well, as I said, like Bangladesh is a is a very inefficient market. I mean, security prices don't reflect their mm -hmm. intrinsic value. And it's like very obvious, like good companies and bad companies. And I think the picking good ones is 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 no brainer. You know, you, you repeat it uh, quite a few times uh, already that uh, the security prices are inefficient, market is inefficient, uh, but it has to converge in the long run, and sure, that's how yeah. you gain, right? Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. I mean, it's a market, right? In the long run, the prices always converge the intrinsic value, right. and that's how value, value investors generate their returns. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what happened, you know, like, we know from from the peak of 2010 till now, mm -hmm. the market cap is, total market capitalization right. of Bangladesh stock market is, is still significantly down, yep. isn't it? Yeah. But during that time frame, some good companies, they have like, uh, the valuation has gone up by like 200%, yeah. you know. So so th that's what happened, and that's what the market efficiency is. So definitely mm -hmm. the market as of now is more efficient than it right. was like five, six years ago. And that journey toward efficiency will continue, mm -hmm. and and that's the opportunity for us. Like when, when a market, uh, I mean, moves from extremely inefficiency if mm -hmm. uh, being extremely inefficient to some level of efficiency right that that's a tremendous opportunity for investors like us to generate uh, excess returns yeah, exactly investment is almost never a destination it's always a journey yeah sure yeah right so what's your minimum return threshold that you look for you look for a good company that and what's the minimum return that would satisfy you as a fund manager and do you have any typical investment time horizon when you uh, invest in a company? Well, uh, uh, what is your expected return, right? right. I think I think for, uh, uh, it's like uh, if you follow the basic finance. I mean, the biggest component of your expected return is basically the risk-free rate, and mm -hmm. and that, as I said, uh, that keeps on moving. Mm -hmm. Like even four years ago, a government bond yield was like. 10-year government bond yield was like more than 10%, yeah. and now it is like less than 6%. Yep. So at that point in time, we had higher allocation on government bonds. Right now, we have uh, we have no allocation mm. on on government bond at all. We are we are almost entirely invested in equity. Well, well. So basically, as the risk-free rate changes, our expected return also changes because we just, we add some risk premium to that risk-free rate in in like. Uh, in um, getting our mm -hmm. expected return, uh, but but I think we expect 10% plus return. Last six mm -hmm. years, of course, on an average, we have generated weighted average return of more than 16% right. of our three funds. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, that that level of extraordinary return may not continue forever mm -hmm. but our expectation is that we should be able to generate a uh, double digit return um, going forward at least for up for next few years and about the time horizon of your investments well we don't have really any such time horizon we just like uh, as long as we see like that the market price is significantly lower than the fair value the expected hmm. the intrinsic value of the company we we hold it you remain uh, invested yeah we remain invested and as i told you before like we are long term oriented we are not like we are not uh, I mean, time is with your side yeah sure yeah. we are not at all concerned we can right. we can hold for 5 6 7 years but hmm. we have some issues as well <coughs> like excuse me hmm. some of our funds two of our funds hmm. are closed in mutual funds right. they have a 
uh, they have a maturity like uh, mm. uh, so in probably four years, four years from now in four years from now the funds will mature and or uh, if our investors want they they can be converted to open open mutual fund if they want to get their money back then we have to redeem redeem them mm-hmm. so uh, and that is also a factor uh, i mean uh, uh, i mean uh, that we think in terms of um, uh, taking our investment decisions like in terms of deciding the time horizon of our investments okay say say for example a particular stock uh, you, you have bought a particular stock at 10 taka and it has gone to 20 taka and then it came down to 15 taka uh, does it bother you no no uh, well no. Uh, well it it does it it might bother but we, we, don't, we don't really care you know okay. we look at the fundamentals of the company right if we think the the intrinsic value of that particular company is 30 taka mm. so price can fluctuate went up in the from meantime. 10 to 20 from we, we, we don't really care okay so so I, and i mean uh, yeah okay so uh, which one is more important to to you as portfolio manager while buying a stock a great business or comfortable valuation well, uh, it ha- I think both, but both. it has to be it has to be a great business, you know. I mean, there's a first criteria. Yeah, first criteria. Right. You, you might have noticed like our portfolio is very concentrated. Yeah. Like we hold only about 12, 13 uh, companies. Stocks. Yeah. Stocks. So uh, the, I mean, they have to be the best companies in terms of governance. The mm-hmm. numbers have to be reliable, mm-hmm. and and the and the management have to be. Uh, good enough mm-hmm. but, um, but but of course valuation is also a factor you know mm-hmm. uh, if we think i mean the uh, the fair value is like 30 taka mm-hmm. if it goes 50 taka mm-hmm. so of course we might uh, try to uh, exit from that investment okay. so so it's a combination of both but, but i think i think first of all the, it has to be a good company mm-hmm. right and uh, do you only sell after the fundamentals of the of the company starts deteriorating or do you sell whenever you think the market is overheating although the company is doing great business wise yeah i think i think it's all about uh, about fundamentals uh, 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 and uh, we have exited a uh, couple of investments mm. entirely in last uh, last couple of years mm. i think it's, it's the because con- they are doing bad from business perspective or the valuation is too much for you? Yeah, it's all, all like the business dynamics changed. Okay. Um, on particular exit or like Titus Cash. Right. You know, it was like, um, uh, uh, it was, a, it's, it, as you know, it's a state-owned mm-hmm. company. Yeah. So what happened like, uh, I mean... The commission the, structure the changed commission structure quite changed. dramatically. Like the, the commission they earned from... from, from it's mm. uh, customer is like fixed by the Bangladesh Energy uh, Regulatory Commission, right. and that I mean that has a, like game-changing effect on the uh, mm-hmm. on the prospect of the company, and we exited completely. So 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 these are the. So uh, what I understand is, uh, regardless of whether you are buying or selling, business fundamentals remain the core of your investment thesis. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. And of course, like when pricing is also a factor. I mean, mm-hmm. of course, if, if mm-hmm. the valuations mm-hmm. goes re- really up, then mm-hmm. then you, you wait for it. Yeah. Right. So I think you already uh, mentioned a bit on the mutual fund sector. So I will just delve deeper in the mutual fund uh, sector in general. Uh, even after your consistent outperformance, your funds are still being traded at 10% discount. You have already mentioned it, and which what. One point of time was trading even at 20-30% discount, uh, your, your closed-end yeah. mutual funds. Uh, do you think our investors are not realizing the value of mutual funds even after successful liquidation or conversion of some of the funds managed by other asset management companies that we have seen in last year? Uh, so is there still a lack of trust or do you think they have some legitimate concerns? Yeah, I think there is still, is still, a, is still a lack of trust. But having said that, like as you said, our funds are trading at at around like 8 to 10 percent discount on a net asset mm-hmm. value i think that is one of the lowest discount among all funds right so mutual fund as a universe is trading at right now around 31 percent discount to net asset value and like maybe about about two years ago and 
the mutual fund funds were trading about like 50 percent discount right. interest value mm. and that point in time the confidence was really really low so the confidence is picking up a little bit <coughs> excuse me but mm. still i think uh the mutual funds don't deserve such discount uh i think um closed and mutual funds will be liquidated when they mature Mm-hmm. and or they will be converted to open ended funds uh and some of the funds have only 2 3 years 4 years uh, uh time before they mature and I, i i i don't think i mean the funds deserve such high discounts to to them and it is valid you you mentioned uh, yourself that after the ma- after the maturity of your closed and mutual funds it will be either converted to open ended funds or be liquidated if yeah. the investors want yeah, if, right so uh, that's pr- pretty forth coming from your part mm. do you think it would help uh, gaining investors confidence if the fund managers if if the asset management companies publicly declared that Uh, you know after the maturity we, we'll just either give your money back or uh, convert our funds into open end funds if you want if they were very forthcoming and you know make a public announcement uh, do you, don't you think it would have yeah, enormous it impact it would definitely on the prices that we see in the sure, mutual funds i'm sure yeah it would definitely help it would uh, in, increase the confidence among investors i know but, it's not needed we don't uh, yeah. but uh, the thing is this is extraordinary times sure. right and uh, the fact that it is tra- your fund if your fund is being traded at 30 40% discount that should hurt you as a fund manager mm-hmm. that some, sure. some pe- there are people who are not believing you yeah. as a fund manager they sure. are not believing on your uh, you know integrity exactly i think i think i think uh, the fund manager should be forthcoming the, they should say like mm. yeah there is absolutely no ambiguity mm. i personally think there is absolutely no chance you know mm. i mean that's the reason we have taken like very high exposure in closed and mutual funds because we believe like there is mm. a law mm. if that doesn't happen if the closed and mutual funds are not liquidated or or are not converted to open ended mutual fund that will be a like a blatant violation of basic mm. contracts right. uh, and 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 if that happens then we won't have a capital market in the country right and, i mean and bangladesh security exchange commission know it they have been like very active uh, do you think regulators can do more in terms of addressing the potential concerns that investors may have in for uh, closed mutual funds in the market Uh, sure uh, the regulators have done quite a lot in last couple of years but they can definitely they can definitely they can do more uh, uh, they can ensure accountability of the fund managers i mean how they are performing mm. the, their fee structure can be based on their performance and also uh, they can ask for more transparency uh, about the holdings of the uh, mutual funds Uh, and some of the funds have been, have not been paying cash dividends i understand mm-hmm. like uh, investors want cash dividend especially the funds that are trading at very steep high discount, discount yeah. steep discount investors can take the cash mm-hmm. and buy the same fund perhaps at a very uh, uh, very high discount right so so those are the things i think regulators can can focus on Uh, do you think they should come up and say you cannot issue reinvestment units uh, if you are a closed mutual fund yeah uh, especially when the funds are trading at a very high discount yeah yeah at that I, point in time i think the cash dividends make more sense yeah to be frank it is one way of cheating the investors if you issue reinvestment units when, when your funds are, dis- are trading at steep discount Yeah, I'm not sure if I would use the word cheating, but but the fact is investors investors are not benefiting uh, mm. from from reinvestment units when the uh, when the funds are funds are uh, trading at very high discount on an net asset value. Right. Uh, Shweta, so your portfolios are publicly available. We can all see it. We can all uh, discuss and track it uh, every every quarter. So. I would like to just ask you uh, about some of your largest holdings that you have uh, to understand your investment thesis and what 
you thought about these companies when you invest in these companies this is of course is a, in a no way uh, a promotion or invitation for our listeners uh, to invest in this company we just want to understand a fund manager's view of these companies and why he invested in these particular names sure. so uh, you, you have uh, 8.26% of your uh, in in one of the closed mutual funds is invested in Bragg Bank. Uh, why do you keep invested? Uh, I know you have you, you have invested in this company quite early uh, before the rally took off. Uh, but why do you keep investing when the company when the stock is trading at 2.8 times of the book value, making it the most expensive bank in Bangladesh from relative valuation perspective? Uh, what's your investment thesis for this particular bank? Well, yes, uh, like Black Bank has rallied quite a lot uh, from the prices where we invested. But the fact is, we still think the bank uh, uh, bank is not overvalued. The reason is like, um, yeah, it is trading like maybe to 2.8 times of, yeah. of book value. Mm-hmm. But, but the bank has a massive potentiality. This is the best government bank in the country. And we think th- Black will be the, the leading bank in the country in a few years' time. Mm-hmm. because they have massive advantage compared to many other banks. They are owned by some very credible institutions, not by any individuals. Mm-hmm. When a bank is owned by individuals, then the yeah the, the governance tend to be very poor because mm-hmm. because the owner, they borrow from some other banks, right. and the directors of that bank mm-hmm. borrow from this bank. Kind of back scratching each other. Exactly. Those type of things happen, but, mm-hmm. but that's, that cannot happen to brag it's not mm-hmm. owned by an individual mm-hmm. it's owned by very uh, highly uh, i mean uh, very, very prestigious institutions and 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 of course like brag uh, brag has 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 a unique advantage i mean uh, in terms of mobile banking the right. mobile banking subsidiary is the dominant player in the industry mm-hmm. and we think mobile banking has a long way to go and brag will benefit from this mobile banking revolution Mm -hmm. uh, uh, than any other bank in the country. And also like despite the fact the price has surged recently, Mm -hmm. I mean the total valuation of the bank is only about like 600, 700 million Mm -hmm. dollar. But if you look at like any other economy like about with a GDP of 200 billion dollar or more, like mm-hmm. the GDP of Bangladesh, Bangladesh, you'd see like the leading banks are having market capitalization of four or five, four or five billion dollar in Pakistan mm-hmm. or in Vietnam. Mm-hmm. Or, or so I think the leading bank in Bangladesh will have a couple of billion dollar valuation, and that might happen if, in few years time. So uh, I think I think Brack is a bank. Mm-hmm which is um, very strongly positioned to be the leading bank in terms of asset size, in terms of profitability, right. in terms of um, customer base. Hmm. Uh, and and we are happy with the current management of the Black Bank as well. They have one of the most dynamic CEOs mm-hmm. in the banking industry. And the bank is investing heavily in technology. We think that is very critical for for driving growth right so overall we are very very bullish on brack it makes sense that uh, a bank is basically a financial intermediary if the economy sure. does well yeah. and if your asset quality is decent mm-hmm. it makes sense that a bank will uh, inevitably do well in that economy exactly right so now your second largest hold one of one of another largest holding is square pharmaceuticals mm-hmm. and given a mutual fund can have maximum 10% exposure in a single stock and you have 9.9% exposure in square pharmaceuticals so it's pretty obvious that you you, you like the business uh, what makes you so convinced about square pharmaceuticals well we like pharmaceutical industry yeah we think that this is one of the um, uh, i mean uh, uh, one of the highly potential industries in our country. Mm-hmm. Uh, the industry has been growing and it ca- it can grow even faster in the next few years. And Square is the leading player in the industry, one of, one of the best governed companies in the industry, one of the most profitable, and the margins have been very high. So, uh, and from valuation perspective as well, like, uh, I mean, the 
the company is still trading at like 18 19 or 20 times of the yeah 19 uh, times probably 19 times of the uh, uh, earnings last 12 months earning and with such high growth i think i think sir it's a obvious choice like mm-hmm. it's one of the one of the best governed uh, companies in the country numbers are reliable people mm-hmm. behind the company are honest mm-hmm. and uh, and the company has a long history it's like uh, is is one of the i mean oldest pharmaceutical company in the country right and their track record has been immaculate in last mm-hmm. uh, many years mm-hmm. and the second generation uh, of the um, of the family is running it they are very capable and um, we don't see any risk factors in terms of leadership in terms of governance of the company and we are very bullish on pharmaceutical industry as, in general as, as the industry in general so the leading player with attractive valuation with great track record should should uh, deserve the highest allocation right right uh, batashu is another company with high exposure sure. in your fund uh, batashu but batashu hasn't really grown as much as many yeah. of us probably expected in last few years this company's five years cagr revenue growth was only 8.5% which was significantly uh, below the nominal economic growth uh, do you think things will be different going forward well ah uh, i think i think bata is like one of the one of the most respected brand consumer brands in the country and the company is trading at like at a total market cap of two, only 200 million dollar mm-hmm. it's like is and it's is is a very well governed company it's a subsidiary of a multinational of course right and uh, and uh, um they have like uh, uh, i mean uh, they have very high margins mm-hmm. and and the low growth i think that mentioned is partly due to like they have been focusing on high end products mm-hmm. and that improved their margin mm-hmm. and you might have noticed like in the last few quarters the earning growth have been have mm-hmm. been phenomenal mm-hmm. and it's trade it has been trading at very attractive valuation right now like 14 15 times exactly. of their last 12 months earning mm-hmm. so a company with such a great brand great distribution network right. throughout the country and their factories located in great places uh, i think bata is a, is a very obvious choice mm-hmm. uh, and uh, uh, and uh, the valuation is so attractive mm-hmm. and and we think if this level of growth persist mm-hmm. in next few years i think bata uh, i mean promises a very high return to us for the next few years perhaps like the entry the timing has not been good mm-hmm. uh, uh perhaps like we started in inter- buying the company at slightly high prices mm-hmm. uh, we have been buying i mean for last two years right uh, but uh, and we have accumulated significant position uh, i mm-hmm. think the our funds right now hold about 2% of the entire company i see and but but i'm very confident that uh, 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 things will be better things will be definitely okay. better uh, your highest exposure in a single stock is actually gramin phone uh, i understand that it is a very well run company with top notch corporate governance and very strong fundamentals uh, but i would like to ask you what potential risks that you could see for gramin phone going forward well i think the only risk is basically technological if there is any disruptive technology mm-hmm. uh, but you know gramin phone is is such a well positioned company in terms of like their uh, uh, like their market share and the, i mean they have gained greatly from like recent um, i mean uh, digital verification of mm-hmm. the sim cards mm-hmm. and if there is like portability of of, of mobile numbers mm-hmm. and they are poised to benefit from that as well so and they are i mean the the data market is growing very fast mm-hmm. and and the in their market share is growing mm-hmm. in that segment so so gravin phone is no brainer it's like um, it's a, it should be top pick for any fund managers yeah but as you mentioned going for a the risk is perhaps the only risk that i see is any disruptive technology but but they are smart uh, 
the uh, Grameen Phone is a smart company, and I think uh, they can position themselves mm-hmm. to that technology, and they can uh, they can continue their business. You know, the last 20 years, the company's mm-hmm. journey has been amazing. Nobody thought mm-hmm. like that there will be a company based in Bangladesh with five to six billion dollar market capitalization, and that happened. Mm-hmm. And company's recent quarters has been like amazing in mm-hmm. terms of their. Given the um, size of the company, yeah, the and still growth. they are growing at a faster pace than the economy. Sure. So that's quite amazing. Absolutely. And, and I think Bangladesh as a country is, is exceptional in terms of like for, for mobile companies. Mm-hmm. It's like concentrated population right. of 160 million. Mm-hmm. You can raise them. And that population is right now hooked to internet. Exactly. And people want mobility. You know, internet mm-hmm. they can get from from broadband or whatever, but people want mobility, and mobile internet is going to be, uh, is going to have great time in the country for n- next at least next few years. Uh, does the regulatory environment uh, related to Grameen Phone concern you as an investor? Not really. I think they are very compliant company. There are issues. If you are a big company, you will have some issues, tax mm-hmm. and regulatory. And I think they can manage it. And I think it's in the interest of our country, of our regulators, of our government, uh, that the Grameen Fund grow, grow because the vision, the vision of the of the government is to have a digital Bangladesh, and that's where Grameen Fund can contribute. I think the issues, few issues that they have, I think um, they can sort it out. Okay, okay. So mutual funds as a sector, you have the highest exposure sure. in this particular sector. 22.5% of your total NAV is actually invested in mutual funds and 20% of total NAV is actually invested in uh, the fund managed by LR Global. Uh, please elaborate to our listeners your investment thesis on investing in these funds. Sure. Well, uh, we invested in mutual funds only only because like they have been trading at very high discount to their net asset value. Right. And, uh, well, and we have been, uh, uh, the weight has been very high on LR Global Funds because we have noticed like some transformation going on that fund management company in the last few years. At point in time, at some point in mm-hmm. time, they used to invest in privately held companies. Mm-hmm. They don't do it anymore. They have exited from those names. Uh, they have been ensuring transparency in terms of like um, uh, disclosing their portfolio. They have been uh, they, they have been giving cash dividend to investors mm-hmm. and most importantly we have seen a dramatic uh, improvement in the portfolio they are basically investing in the companies that we like the reason we are investing in a large global fund is that we are getting exposure to the companies the mm-hmm. same companies where we invest mm-hmm. but but we are getting them at 30 percent 35 percent discount so it's no brainer it's like right you take position in that company. So, and, and some of the funds where we invested mm-hmm. are due to mature in two, three years time. So you're holding a fund, you're buying a fund that is trading at 30, 35% discount. The fund matures in two year time. Mm-hmm. And then what happened? You know, even if like the fund doesn't generate any return, <laughs> you're two year, in two year horizon, mm-hmm. you make about like, 15 20 percent mm. per year right and the assumption that the funds will not generate any return in two years is is, mm. is very conservative mm. and uh, and as their portfolio is very much like about 80 or 90 percent of their portfolio is very much like the portfolio of ours mm-hmm. and if we invest in that funds at 35 percent discount mm-hmm. I think I think it's, it's makes a, just yeah, automatic sense absolutely right uh, you, you have only long exposure and in, in, in Bangladesh you can only have long exposure in yeah. stock market uh, does it you know frustrate you at times that you can't short sell some of the stocks that no, you think it, overvalued? It does I think it would frustrate to any investment professionals because we have we have like positive expectations about some companies mm-hmm. and we have negative expectations about other companies mm-hmm. so in a market like ours you can act based on your positive expectations only. Right. So, uh, so basically, I mean, you are using only half of your potentiality, mm-hmm. you know, because the market doesn't allow you to sell short. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, 
uh, you're not able to act based on your expectation. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think short selling has should be there. I think uh, short selling should be there before the regulators think of introducing ETF or derivatives mm -hmm. because short selling has been in many market for hundreds of years. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's a part of parcel of any market. Right. Uh, so, but given that our, mar our, our market doesn't even understand what mutual fund is, yeah. uh, do you think short selling can have some you know, negative repercussions? No, well, it can be like, uh, it can be sort of controlled. They can allow on only perhaps companies with certain market capitalization with some conditions, they can test the ground with like few companies or like uh, under few restrictions. Mm -hmm. um, so, but yeah, you pertinently basically address the issue of mutual funds trading mm -hmm. at 30% uh, at or so discount at mm -hmm. net asset value. I think that should get the regulators focus first. And that's a big issue. You know, right. it's a shame for, for the country, for the, the industry. Mm -hmm. You know uh, that uh, that that such level of uh, distortion persisting for so long a period of time. Passive investing is a big issue across the world, and people are flocking together to invest in the exchange traded funds, and uh, you know probably choosing for other means to invest in uh, in a passive way. Uh, but we don't have any ETFs in Bangladesh, and our you know even if the market has rallied. Uh, significantly from uh, from this level, uh, probably you know ma majority of the population will not realize the benefit of that. Uh, so, do you think a uh, you know a way of uh, introducing ETF uh, can probably disseminate the benefits of a strong capital market to the general population? Well, well I think uh, that there should be awareness about the product. People should know about it. But passive investing is something I'm not a big fan of. I think Bangladesh market is very inefficient. Mm -hmm. uh, I think active management can add value. And that's the market risk to a certain level of efficiency. Mm -hmm. And then those type of products like passive investment products become right. uh, relevant. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Excuse me. But at this level of market efficiency, I think passive investment products don't make very strong sense. Do you see more space for a lot of active fund managers, uh, given that you already mentioned in uh, somewhere in the in this episode that uh, there are not many great companies in Bangladesh. So if there are like 10 good fund managers out there and everybody tries to buy the names that you mentioned, there will be some definitely, you will probably not get these companies at great valuation that you would like to have. Sure. Uh, so do you think that there is enough space for the market to Not allow really, yeah. a lot of fun, good fund managers. No, because market has to grow. We need a lot of investable good companies, well-governed companies. Mm -hmm. And for that to happen, we need some basic reform in corporate governance, in accounting and auditing practices, because financial statements are not reliable in general. Mm -hmm. So our regulators, our government has to make sure that financial statements are reliable. and the companies have to be proper company. Most of the companies are basically held by families mm -hmm. and they run like proprietorship. Even mm -hmm. banks are run like proprietorship. Mm -hmm. That shouldn't happen. The company should be company. The company is a separate legal mm -hmm. entity from the owners and the company has its own uh, uh, business entity concept. Right. So, that has to be that has to be ensured, uh, and uh, and there are a lot of practices, unhealthy and corrupt practices in the private sector mm -hmm. in managing companies, and that has to be stopped before mm -hmm. we have a vibrant and and big capital market that you want. Some of the big names in Bangladesh, local and even multinational names, are not listed in the country. Uh, why do you think that's the case and uh, can regulators or any any uh, probably wing in the government can force this, this local or international company uh, multinational companies to get listed in the stock market no I'm not in favor of uh, forcing it's the company's own corporate uh, 
corporate finance decision if right. they, if they want to raise capital if mm-hmm. they think going public can reduce their what it refers uh, cost of capital mm-hmm. uh, then uh, they will do that mm-hmm. and the government tried previously to uh, to motivate the companies get listed by offering tax benefits mm-hmm. i think those routes can be tried if 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 as we want to have mm-hmm. a bigger capital market right but forcing is not an option okay okay so uh, shoyb you are also the president of cfa society bangladesh and the society itself has been uh, very active in recent times uh, what are the what are your plans going forward regarding the society and uh, wh- what do you think cfa can play a role how 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 do cfas can play a role in vibrant capital market or probably vibrant financial services uh, industry in general well uh, my vision about cfa society of bangladesh is that like we want to increase our member base that means we want to increase the number of cfa chapter holders in the country mm-hmm. right now we have only about 60 I think if you want a big capital market, if mm. you want a big economy, we need a lot of qualified investment professionals. Right. So CFA is a great designation uh, for this industry, mm. and if we, that's why we are promoting the CFA designation uh, in the universities among the young professionals, and we want them to take CFA exam. We want them to pass mm. and be our member. Uh, and you said like the role of cfa right. you know it's like uh, the the reason our market is one of the, the most inefficient is that we don't have too many qualified investment professionals in last couple of years we have seen like many cfa chapter holders entering to the industry they have become like uh, research analysts mm. head of research portfolio mm. managers mm. and i think that helped the industry greatly uh, and and the the journey towards efficiency has has been faster mm-hmm. and uh, the reason the 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 capital uh, i mean the market is more efficient much more efficient now than it it was 5 6 years ago is that like i think the cfa chapter holders uh, they have been like uh, they have been playing a crucial role. crucial role in the industry and uh, by helping create many charter holders i think we mm. can help the industry and and our country so so that's why we have we have created the society mm. we want we want it to grow and and also the society is uh, is uh, like helping the industry in many way we are engaging with regulators with mm. exchanges uh we are doing we're trying to introduce best practices uh in the market so uh, and we have a lot more to do and and uh, we are very excited that uh, that the society is up and running and members are very involved they're right. very passionate and we can keep doing what we are doing say i'm an inver- university student entering my final year uh, what would be my biggest motivation what should be my biggest motivation uh, for pursuing cfa what would i gain from this professional degree well uh, well if you if you want to be an investment professional if you want to be investment professional i think it's a great uh, great uh, designation to pursue and i personally think i mean uh, investment profession is a great profession it involves cap- capital allocation mm-hmm. and it and capital allo- allocation proper capital allocation play a critical role in generating wealth of a country right so cfa chapter holders and investment professionals uh, they they have tremendous impact on the uh, on the on the life of people mm-hmm. so it's a great profession to to pursue i mean the investment profession mm-hmm. and cfa mm-hmm. designation mm-hmm. is a is a great designation if you want to be in investment profession thank you shoyb bhai so much for giving us the time it was a uh, real pleasure for me and i'm pretty sure our in uh, for listeners as well thank you again thank you so much for uh, for having me